including renormalization of young male series, monopole, instant palm, large head expansion, holography, and many, many others. These ideas, which were revolutionary when they were first introduced, are still centerpiece of modern field theory and strictly. For his work on renormalizability of young Hill theory, the was awarded the 1999 Nobel Prize. The Nobel, the Nobel Committee said that he was awarded the prize for having placed particle physics theory on a firm mathematical foundation. Sidney Coleman described it somewhat differently. In his characteristic style, he said, that Hoof's work turned the Weinberg Salam frog into an enchanted prince. <laughs> so let's welcome Sir Hadesu. Thank you very much, uh, Nathan. Um, I was just asked to give you a short tutorial about Dutch language and how to pronounce my name, uh, but it's hardly necessary because uh, Nathan did it nearly correctly. Uh, Practically, so my name is Gerard Het Hoofd, and um, uh, Het Hoofd is my last name, which the apostrophe T stands for het, H-E-T, which is in spoken language often abbreviated into Het, and there are many other names like this. For instance, there's this chemist van het Hof, which is a clearly related name but somewhat different, and. Um, uh, Gerard is pronounced as the high G. In our country, like in many places uh, in the old times, it was uh, quite uh, commonplace to give someone an official name and then a use name. My official name is Gerardus, with a US ending, but it's normally only used on passports and driver's licenses. And as it now also turns out to be on uh, Nobel uh, uh, documents. So, um, and this is now why often people call me Gerardus, because that's what they see. Anyway, um, so this, is, uh, this conference is about the past and the future and the present of quantum field theory and quantum chronodynamics. I always find it a little bit silly to talk about the future, because it will always be, uh, you'll always be uh, punished by the real future uh, when it comes, although nobody cares, of course. Um, it's much more interesting to talk about the past and that I'll mainly do that. Like uh, any of the other speakers, I, uh, Sydney was a great guru for me in, uh, in particle physics and uh, just discussing with him always has been a delight. Um, but uh, let me start with the beginning. Um, when did I first meet Sydney? That was in 1971, in June, July. It was just about my 25th, 25th birthday that uh, my thesis advisor, uh, Tinus Veldman, sent me out to present our work on the Amsterdam conference, where he was one of the organizers, one of the session chairmen. And uh, as session chairman, of course, he gave most most of the um, uh, time that he, uh, was allotted to him to people like T.D. Lee and Abdus Salam who would present their important new ideas about high energy physics and there was 10 minutes left over for me to say something about how to renormalize the non abelian gauge theories. <laughs> and um, uh, I, I must say I immediately got very, very positive responses. Uh, it was clear that the community had been waiting for such a thing. So uh, also perhaps if, if we hadn't done it, somebody else would have. Because, uh, because I got this, all these delighted responses, uh, in particular, for instance, by um, uh, Benjamin Lee and others. Oh, I should not forget to just briefly say the contents of my talk. The, uh, uh, my talk will be a series of stories of the, the past. We all talk about the happy 70s, perhaps uh, it, a proper name would be the gay 70s, but now that's not so proper anymore. I use the word happy 70s, but we all have delightful memories of those days. There was uh, a renormalization came about 
asymptotic freedom was being discovered, the JAPE side discovery, the whole uh, development around instantons, then the, the standard model which came into being, and, and then I have some miscellaneous things to say about the cosmological constant, and probably I won't have time to say anything about black holes, which, I, uh, which is my modern uh, subject. So uh, this is the picture I want to say, is, uh, one of the people who were very uh, much uh, influenced and, and, and uh, are impressed by these new ideas was Benjamin Lee and Simancic, both of whom I knew from my previous uh, participation at the Cagese summer school. And um, uh, they were considered the expert, the world experts on renormalization. And I was very, very happy that they were both also enthusiastic uh, in uh, spending their energies on these new theories. Although Simancic would only turn to gauge theories much, much later. But Benjamin Lee, uh, uh, well, he, he just dropped what he was doing and he went into gauge theories. And, uh, and he made some very fine uh, contributions there. Um, uh, but uh, Veldsman, uh, when uh, he sent me there, he was looking very much forward to this occasion because he was going to show that all his work had not been uh, for nothing because many of the experts in those days really thought that quantum field theory was the wrong way to go. Um, Veldman mistrusted many of most of the other physicists. Benjamin Lee was one of his friends and Simancic was a sort of a, well, a distant hero and uh, f a fine and honest physicist. Uh, you, nobody hated Simancic. Um, so, um, but then he said all the others uh, you shouldn't trust. So here <laughs> And, and then, that, when he said that, uh, there were two physicists uh, walking around in the corridor, and Feldman said to me, okay, let me introduce you to two American gangsters. <laughs> and um, uh, so the gangsters came close, and, they, uh, and I was introduced to them, and then uh, they said, well, they were interested in going to see the darker parts of Amsterdam where they uh, had heard so much about, so they wanted to, to have some experiences there. So uh, these two people introduced themselves as Sidney Coleman and Shelley Glashow. <laughs> and, um, and I soon had, I, uh, well, but then after talking to them, I really quickly realized that I had to renormalize my first impression quite a bit, uh, because uh, whenever, as soon as they opened the mouth, as soon as they started to discuss physics and renormalization, I found that these people indeed are very, very smart physicists, and it's fun to talk physics with them. And I found that what had taken me hours to explain to Veldman at some point, you know, only took five minutes uh, <laughs> or, or less. You know, they already knew it from, from, the, from the talk that, that uh, uh, this was the correct way, the correct attitude to, towards uh, gauge theory, spontaneous breakdown, and all that. Um, so later on I started to understand much better why Veldman mistrusted so much or practically all the experts. I think the problem was what Frank Wilczek already mentioned, that the, the, there was this consensus, particularly among those who had studied quantum field theory really well, there was this consensus led by a particular Landau that quantum field theory was no good. Landau had proven that the theory uh, is very sick in the, infra, in the ultraviolet, so you shouldn't even try to renormalize. Renormalization was wrong, and so on. We've heard the stories many times, but um, it's only much later I realized that Landau had based this, this opinion on the way field theories scale, or at least all field theories known at the time. The way they scale, it's, it clearly doesn't make any sense in the, in the ultraviolet region. But uh, I had studied young Mill's theory quite well, and uh, among the difficulties I had with randomization, one obvious thing to try is how does this theory scale to the ultraviolet? And actually, that was the first theory I ever tried to scale transform, and I found it was all fine in ultraviolet. Everything, all the coupling constant goes away logarithmically, but that seems to be just uh, the way it should. So uh, I didn't see any difficulty with these theories, so I couldn't quite understand why the experts were so strongly opposed against quantum field theory. Uh, on the other hand, my advisor felt one didn't really want to consider scaling at all because that brings the theory off the mass shell. And he is very much oriented towards phenomenology 
and experimental observations. And experimentalists never do an experiment off Marshall, he said. So it doesn't make any sense to scale. And um, so he also did not really understand why people were so strongly opposed against quantum field theory. And uh, for Veldman, it's quite clear that uh, everybody who was smarter than him, he considered as being a gangster. I mean, that those, uh, that those were his enemies. And, uh, but the really reality was that many of these people said, Veldman, you're on the wrong track. This is no good. This is, uh, these theories will never work. So in, in a way, uh, I, I now understand, I think, that, that how, how these, uh, these opinions came about. Um, so, uh, like I said, Sydney became a guru for us and we started to, to uh, study many aspects of renormalization. Among one of those was dimensional renormalization, which was discovered uh, shortly after that or it's, it's complete you know, um, extent to how, how you can use that, that way of renormalizing thing, things. Uh, dimensional renormalization was extremely important for us. And the reason is in this diagram, it was known, and this was the work by Steve Adler and Bell and Jakiv independently, that under, in some cases, the, if you try to renormalize a theory, the counter terms that you have to introduce seem to violate the symmetries that actually you want. So that, that are, can be intrinsic clashes if you try to write down counter terms for theories. And th this, this is the primary example, the triangle diagram. There you know that if you impose both vector symmetry and axial vector symmetry or chiral symmetry, then this diagram gives you an, an internal clash. So there the renormalization program definitely fails or it, it seems to fail, and uh, we want to be sure that this is the only case, because we, we might think of repairing this difficulty in this particular case by either adding as many right-handed as left-handed fermions, or having only the vector part of the fermions coupled to the gauge field. In that case, there was no difficulty, but this must have been a warning sign by nature. Maybe there are other difficulties of this sort, and so if you just uh, renormalize in a rather naive way by just subtracting left and right and, and replacing infinite integrals by finite integrals, you might be doing it wrong. So how to be sure that the symmetry is being kept intact? And the only obvious correct answer was find the regularization procedure that respects gauge invariance all the way. That would make our lives a lot easier. Much later, I would learn that Ken Wilson had his way of phrasing field theory, gauge theory in particular, on a lattice. And field theory on a lattice would be just one other way to regularize a theory. Of course, putting a theory in a lattice, it makes all the infinite integrals convergent, so, uh, or uh, finite even, so, there's no, uh, so it certainly is a legitimate way to regularize a theory, but it's also very clumsy. On the, nobody actually does perturbation theory of engaged theories on a lattice, because these integrals are going to be extremely complicated to work out. So uh, dimensional regularization is sort of, uh, is in that respect, much, much more elegant. And um, it came... Okay, so this is why uh, we thought things are very important, and uh, this is one of the cases where I completely missed something I thought that perhaps even if your theory has a chiral anomaly, maybe there's still a way to replace this case diagram with something finite. Because I find it difficult to believe that, that a, a crazy high order diagram like this would just invalidate the entire theory. There should be something else than just matching the anomaly. Nowadays, you know that matching the anomaly is the only way, so matching left and right to each of the general plus the anomaly example is the only correct way to deal with the situation. Now, uh, of course, uh, I, uh, at, at this point, it, it, you know, I want to give my side of the isotopic freedom story. Uh, I think every, uh, many physicists involved with the whole development of isotopic freedom has, have their own story to tell. And it, it, it's a marvelous example of, of confusion in our science, <coughs> of, of a, a depth and importance that we haven't seen often before or after that uh, there was a big understanding that quantum field theory was by definition not asymptotically free. And we could actually prove that. Of course, we could only prove that for the non-gauge theories. But, um, uh, but it seems to be inescapable that we cannot be asymptotically free. Um, so what we first do is we look at the theory by a magnifying glass, and then we see a new exchanges of particles that we couldn't see without the magnifying glass. And these forces, 
that you really find we normalize the cosmic constant when you make a scale transformation. And this implies the emergence of a beta function that is positive for most ordinary theories. Um, so in, in young girls' case, uh, you have to do the same calculation, but there are extra spin one particles which are coupled to uh, their spin one particles which uh, are contributing to the um, vacuum calculations. And because of that, the expression of the data function becomes more complicated. Now, this has a very long history, and it was written by Russian friends. They have their versions of, of the story to tell. There were these, two, these people, Vanyashi and Kirentev, who way back in 1965, they calculated the vacuum polarization due to charged vector particles. This was not yet a young Mill student. This was just a theory of charged vector particles. They found a negative sign, but they said that can't be right because everyone knows that these signs must be positive. So probably this is because a theory with charged vector particles is not renormalizable. Of course, if it isn't a young Mills theory, it's not renormalizable. So, um, so what else could have said? Um, <coughs> then there's Kripovich, who also computed the vacuum polarization in a pure young Mills theory. And he found the correct expression, but he did not link it to the beta function. It was just the counter term in renormalization that uh, he, he computed. He found again the anomalous sign in the charge renormalization, but not drawing any further conclusions from that. Um, in uh, my own case, well, uh, I, I should do this one. In my own case, um, I done this calculation several times, but uh, this is also an empty calculation. And since many of the experts are doing much, much more complicated research on young Mills theory, I couldn't understand that nobody else had actually done such, uh, to my mind, a rather straightforward and simple calculation. Um, so I did it to try to understand renormalization and actually what I had at the time was essentially the thing that David Pollock had written down in 1973. But as I also explained that uh, that one was essentially disinterested and he advised me what he said he wanted to try to really, you know. But I was also thinking about the theory for quarks, but this should be a theory that we try quarks and uh, in, in sort of confined manner. But uh, that one was the first to criticize this and say, look, if you have a theory of quarks, you have to explain why the quarks don't come out. Why does experimentally not detect single quarks? This is a confinement problem. I did not have an answer to satisfy myself, so I said, I can't answer the question, so I'll work and see if I can answer the question. But this is a very difficult question. Um, so I, when I did write my paper in 1971 <coughs> about the massive young Mills theory, I had come to the mass that phase, and understood that was renormalizable, and also that its ultraviolet uh, behavior is secure. And actually, if you look in the paper, it's published in 71, if you look at the, on the first page on the lowest lines, uh, there was one statement where I referred to Weinberg, because I'd read a very complicated long paper by his and, um, uh, on the young Mills um, uh, infrared behavior. Uh, Another story about that, but I don't go into too many of these stories. But anyway, I tried to read the paper, I failed, it was actually complicated. But I thought, if someone has studied so much, why doesn't he say anywhere that the theory scales this way? But, uh, but if, if his conclusion is that the infrared difficulty of young Mills is also too complex, that you can't just use simple minded infrared realization, uh, infrared subtraction plus the QED, then he must have known that he is not absolutely free in infrared, which means that. So, uh, I'm, well, I didn't quite understand what he said, but I did say, well, he was asked as such, the perturbation expansion takes down in the infrared region, and if you have no rigorous field theory, you just try to have it in that domain. Uh, so, um, what's missing in this paper is to Paul's uh, Paul's in 1973. Um, anyway, so we know now, now so, so this was the general view, the beta is negative, and that this should, in principle, explain the behavior of the quarks in a hadron. But from there, to understand that quarks cannot come up at all is a confinement problem, and that one I definitely have not solved. So I, I thought, well, OK, if you keep thinking about answering that question also, let me concentrate on that question. That was a big mistake, of course, so I uh, 
Okay, so I should immediately add to this that I think the prize is well deserved because uh, these three people together, they uh, did add some important ingredients which I had not properly understood. I had not properly understood the connection between this and Bjorkain scaling because I thought this is an experiment. Experiments are on my shell. How can they have something to do with the deep Euclidean domain of quantum field theory? This is an area, of course, we know that it has everything to do with the deep Euclidean domain of quantum field theory. And, uh, and, and also there are other things, you know, I didn't see the direct relation between that and even the Kalman semantic equations, although there must have been something the same thing. But, but um, anyway, uh, that was cleared up. And also, of course, uh, these three friends of mine, they published exactly um, in, in great detail their findings, and that is what comes in Stockholm. So, um, uh, so that was, and, and, and of course also the, uh, the everyone else who was uh, in, involved with, uh, with the strong interactions trying to understand Bjorkane scaling reacted particularly on those two papers and, uh, and it revolutionized our view on the strong interactions. Um, so, but I think I've learned my lesson and from that moment on I decided not to wait. If I have a new idea, I should publish it immediately. <laughs> and fortunate for me, I, I still had some, some nice ideas left which I published immediately. One was the magnetic monopole and uh, because I wanted to understand quark confinement, you see, so I wanted to understand more about topology of gauge theories, and then you hit upon this magnetic monopole. I thought I was nearly there to understand confinement, but uh, it out came something else. And then I looked at, uh, at QCD, but now, uh, at, I considered the, uh, to vary the num number n of, uh, of the colors. And uh, in the n to infinity limit, I found structures which look very much like strings connecting quarks. So I again thought I'm nearly there understanding confinement. So, but I, this time I did not wait publishing uh, those papers. And uh, so uh, that lesson came, uh, well, it was a, a good lesson for me anyway, and I profited from it. Um, so anyway, uh, here are my friends, and this is what happened to them. And uh, uh, so... <laughs> Right, and um, uh, uh, so uh, yes. Then the next chapter in um, uh, in, in in the happy seventies or the gay seventies uh, was um, oh. Before that, I wanted to, but already uh, uh, Frank Wilczek has explained that. So I'll go very briefly. The question: Why is there a negative sign in the beta function? And uh, I, I totally agree with Frank, who attributed this to the magnetic moments of these particles. You see, you can you can th think of vacuum fluctuations, vacuum polarizations. If you put, uh, if you take um, a strong electric field between condenser plates, then the vacuum uh, polarization, the, the particles that produce vacuum polarization, the virtual particles, they get aligned and so they tend to screen any electric fields. And that's the basic phenomenon of screening, which means that at short distances the fields are relatively strong compared to the fields at large distances because they, are, they tend to be screened to the, by the virtual particles. Whereas in the case of the magnetic, uh, of, of the vector particles, the young mills particles, they carry a fairly large amount of magnetic moment. The magnetic moment has an anomalous, well, not an anomalous term, but the, the, the canonical term for the magnetic moment of the vector particles is large. It's, their G factor is one uh, or, or a two, like, just like uh, the um, electrons. So they tend to have a, a relatively large magnetic moment. And the large magnetic moment is exactly the same term that shows up 
with the opposite sign when you do the calculation. So the explanation of this is that there's magnetic screening. Magnetic fields are being screened very efficiently by the magnetic dipole moments of these vector particles. And in fact, the screening is exactly 12 times as strong as the electric screening. And then you say, if there's magnetic screening, then that must be the opposite to electric screening because the product of the uh, electric, uh, dielectric constant of the vacuum and the magnetic permeability of the vacuum should always be one because that's the velocity of light and that's independent of scale. So if you have magnetic screening, you must have electric anti-screening and vice versa. So that's the minus sign. It gives you minus 12. And then there's a plus one because these particles, of course, also contain ordinary electric charges and they give vacuum polarization and that leads you to a factor of minus 11. And the crazy thing is this is a universal 11, an 11 which is the same 11 for all gauge theories. And uh, uh, I sometimes ask string theorists, is this number 11 related to uh, 26 dimensions minus 4? Then you have 22 left, there are 22 extra dimensions. And uh, there's suspicion that the 11 has to, so I see uh, David nodding, I'm not sure what it means. Uh, but, um, <laughs> It could well be that that 11 is the same 11 as you get from string theory. Uh, it would be very nice if true, because that would suggest that there is at least an underlying string theory for pure QCD. Um, so I would like to know more about that. But this is simply something I still don't quite understand. So now comes, oh, and before this, I, I, this, well, I don't have any pictures of this, the Jape size story. Um, I should keep my time. Yeah, the J psi story. Well, I think I should skip that because otherwise uh, I not miss I will miss too much of the other things. The instantons uh, came next, and the instanton, of course, we all remember Sidney by his, his for his great contributions to the instanton. The instanton is basically a mapping of the SU2 gauge group onto uh, three-dimensional space. That gives you an, a, a topologically non-trivial gauge transformation in three space and you can ask whether states are invariant under such transformations or not. And that gives you the theta angle. And um, uh, Sidney was one of the few people who immediately understood all the details of this, uh, why this is an angle, and, uh, and um, uh, how the why the angle cannot depend on space and time and things like this. And um, so this is, this is the mapping. And um, Uh, that he explained in his beautiful Erich lectures about the uses of instantons. I still vividly remember that while explaining this, he was, he was taking a, a cord of his microphone and, uh, well, these are not long enough, but uh, I can steal it from my computer for a short moment. He was using a cord of his microphone and winding it around his neck like this. And then he explained that this is topologic, makes a topological invariant. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so, um, That was his way of explaining instantons, and of course the students loved that, and uh, he was named best lecturer for, of that year, in fact of all years, of, in Erice. This photograph you now find on the walls in Erice, uh, but in, in between uh, hundreds of other photos which show Nino Zikiki with the Pope. And, uh, Uh, but uh, among uh, apart, not all photos show Nino Zikiki with the Pope. There's also this photograph of Sidney Coleman and me there. And um, uh, I think uh, but the picture that quickly emerged about instantons is that they do something very funny with fermions. And uh, uh, I had my way of seeing it, and uh, many other people had different ways of seeing it. There were also physicists in Moscow who were involved with the instantons and tried to understand what was happening. But the picture that emerged was simply this, that as time goes on, and you have an instanton, which is an event in space and time, then you have left, going, left rotating modes and right rotating modes for the fermions. And one of the left rotating modes goes from positive energy to negative energy. And one of the right rotating modes will go from negative energy to positive energy. So that means that In the whole fermion C, fermions and antifermions, one fermion changes into an antifermion, uh, or one left changes into an antifermion, which means that if this position was an occupied state, it now becomes just part of the, of the Dirac C of the negative energy particles, and vice versa. If this particle is occupied because it's in the Fermi C, it now emerges as an occupied state with positive energy. So the net effect is that a particle which rotates to the left is turned spontaneously into a particle that rotates to the right. And that happens, happens independently for every flavor that's coupled to the instanton. 
this beautiful picture, I'm, uh, well, uh, we learned that by discussing with each other, but I have a strong suspicion that Sydney was maybe the first to really see it in, in these uh, vivid, this, this transparent way, what the incident actually does to fermions. So the incident explicitly breaks chiral symmetry. Now here, there were, Sydney made a remark in this lecture, which was, I think, misunderstood by many people, because he then said the eta particle is a red herring, in typically his language. The eta particle is a red herring. So some people thought that the eta, therefore, it does, is not a companion of the pions or something like that. But of course it is. The eta, the eta particle and the pions are in a non-net representation of SU3 flavor. And the only thing is that the mass of the eta is not degenerate with the mass of the pion. Its mass is being lifted by the instanton. And um, I think Sydney understood this very, very well. Uh, and we all then learned uh, how, uh, how this mechanism works. But, uh, but he made it seem from his lectures that the eta particle is simply not a, a member of the known net at all. It's just something else. And that, that, that I don't think uh, is what he, he wanted to say. At least uh, I don't agree with that statement. The other great developments of the 70s was the development of the standard model. First, of course, the incomplete version without chime, which didn't work, so you had to add a further uh, chimed quark in there, so then the standard model became much better. And then, of course, also in the 70s, we discovered that uh, you need at least a third generation somewhere, and uh, uh, everyone started to search for the top and the bottom quark. These were great times. I remember Shelley Glashow, who was very strongly urging the uh, experimental physicists to look for chime, because chime was obviously there, we all knew it was there, but you just had to wait and see and find it. And then again, that was the great, those were the great days, and also J Psi was being discovered, and uh, chime was found uh, right where it was supposed to be. Um, then I want to spend a little bit of time on the, uh, on what happened after that. We had the, the nice and easy things and the beautiful uh, confrontation with experiment that all these theories had. But uh, then we had to go on and we all agreed that the next thing to figure out is the gravitational force. This, this one graviton which is missing so far in the standard model and we have a clearly incomplete way of adding the gravitational force everywhere. So this is now where we should all concentrate our efforts. And one of the very deep and fundamental questions is the cosmological constant. Why is it so small? And here, uh, Sydney had an answer. Oh, I, I forgot this uh, picture here. This picture is uh, showing the, the th comparison between theory and experiment. Theory and experiment seem to agree beautifully as measured by the uh, early version of LAP and it, it wasn't that quite difficult to match those curves very precisely. The solid curves here are the theoretical uh, prediction, the dots are the experimental measurements. Th you could tune the curve a little bit because you could vary the number of neutrinos. If you would have a different number of neutrinos, the width of these peaks here would have been different. But if you assume three neutrinos, you go right through the points very accurately, and so uh, this established exactly number three as a number of neutrinos. And, and then, of course, the days came that we wanted to find more, and so lab two was being installed, and it was measuring the rest of the things. And it turned out that the theoretical curve and the lab two measurements just agreed as if no further change is there to be expected. The standard models, as it was then, still works uh, now. And uh, well, what we're waiting, of course, is, is, is to see the Higgs particle and such. So, um, so then we turn away from our intention, away from the standard model, and we start to study uh, gravitational things. And one of the fundamental things is the cosmological constant. And I haven't yet seen a description of um, uh, Sydney's ideas about baby universes. It was uh, one of his toy ideas. He treated the whole idea as his baby, but it was really the, the universe that behaves as a baby. Uh, there are many uh, sort of satellite universes to ours, was his idea, and somehow these universes uh, are connected to ours by what he called wormholes. So a wormhole could s sit in our universe as such, uh, being a little uh, topologically non-trivial thing in the space-time metric of our universe. And wormholes could also sit on baby universes, but then they could be connected 
by wormholes to our universe. And out of this, Sidney uh, styled a, um, a theory that should explain why the observed cosmological constant is as small as it is. Well, uh, we hear new theories about this every day, even uh, right an hour ago I heard about the new theory of the cosmological constant. There are hundreds of theories about the cosmological constant, so once I, uh, I was I decided, well, I wanted to write a paper where so far I only have the title. The title is 200 Wrong Theories for the Cosmological Constant. <laughs> and I also know the number of references. I would, have to, I would put 200 references in that paper. Um, but I didn't have the patience ever to, to read all those papers. So, so far I started giving that to a graduate student to, to read, <laughs> to at least tell me what's in all those papers. But... Uh, and then want to list them in what way are they wrong. And um, I, I still think the correct theory has not been found. Here also, um, I don't think the correct theory has been found. These, uh, these wormholes are very interesting, but you have to remember that if they connect a point A with a point B, then the points A and the point B doesn't have to be close together. Point B can be anywhere else in the universe even if the wormhole is a very small wormhole. In fact, you have to integrate over all positions of the points B, which immediately uh, leads you to the conclusion that point B cannot absorb any energy or momentum. So the wormhole cannot absorb energy or momentum because you have to integrate over all of space and time. So you always get a, a mom energy momentum zero uh, contribution. So what A and B really do is just renormalize effective couplings in the theory. So the theory may have all sorts of coupling strengths and they are getting modified by the effects of wormholes. Now a wormhole can also have a particle go, go in it, like a, a baryon. A baryon could go into the wormhole at A and leave the wormhole at B, but B could be somewhere else in the universe. So effectively this would be a theory that violates baryon number conservation. So wormholes can easily violate any symmetry that you impose on the system, except for local symmetries, because they are connected to long-range fields. But, glo but global symmetries can all be broken by these wormholes. But what you'll get in the very end is the theory will, will renormalize all its couplings, whether or not they are symmetric, they'll get different values, until you have taken into account all the wormholes, and all the wormholes disappear. So the bottom line of such a theory is that you have... A, a topological uh, um, no-go theorem that there is, will be no effective wormhole left. You take them all into account and then all the effects of wormholes disappear so the wormholes will be topologically forbidden. And um, that I think is a very important conclusion saying that indeed wormholes are red herrings and they, um, they should be left out of the functional integral in, in quantum gravity. I think that's a very important conclusion and uh, nearly, nearly every day uh, articles appear where people still try to introduce wormholes into the function integral for quantum gravity. In fact, one of the very last persons to agree about that was Stephen Hawking. This, here you see uh, three actors on the screen. And, um, uh, so this is uh, Stephen's uh, uh, starring in an episode of Star Trek. And... Um, uh, but, uh, but he finally, only a year ago, wrote a paper where he, he discovered that, um, or he gave a controversial contribution where he discovered that wormholes don't give a contribution in a function integral. But his wormholes are slightly different. His wormholes are the wormholes that describe black holes. And that's not quite the same thing as what I wrote there. A black hole wormhole can be understood if you take a space-time uh, universe. Now I draw the space-time of the universe here as a two-dimensional sheet. So I've removed two dimensions out of the real world in showing this transparency. The boundary of the universe therefore looks like two lines, two circles. But actually the boundary of the universe is a circle here. Uh, so uh, that's for adding again the dimension at the edge of the universe. This is the universe at finite temperature so that you have a a periodicity in Euclidean time, and that, that is repre represented by this circle. So this circle is cut through because I remove one dimension to show the picture, and so you just see two lines, and filling up these two lines is a function integral for a universe at a finite temperature. So actually, the, at the finite temperature you have the topology of the universe uh, multiplied by the topology of the circle at infinity. 
but the circle of infinity in this picture just looks like two lines. Then uh, Hawking discovers that basically uh, if you then put a topological non-trivial hole in here, you're actually describing a black hole at a given temperature. Once this thing uh, connects here, uh, these different uh, elements of the circle uh, at, at, at this origin here, which is the horizon, then you can understand that um, that now the black hole forces the universe to be at a given temperature, which is just what, uh, what he has found. The, uh, black holes radiate uh, particles. And um, uh, so you see that, that the functional integral for any universe contains uh, construction without a uh, topological hole in it. And then these holes, you can put as many more holes in this Swiss cheese as you, as you like. You can put many more um, uh, black holes in the system as you like. And this way you get the function integral including black holes. But Hawking discovered that these are uh, topologically distinct. You cannot simply add that to the functional integral. And from that he eventually concludes that, um, th that uh, he thinks he has solved the information paradox of the black holes. A very important conclusion I don't think uh, the way I phrase it this way, certainly I don't agree with, with the uh, conclusion, but he has uh, more intricate arguments in his mind which I couldn't completely follow. Um, so, uh, I think I'm running sort of out of time. Uh, how much time do I have left, if any? Oh, then I can still say perhaps a little bit about uh, black holes. So, we have the um, fundamental discovery that if you take, if you assume that black holes somehow do form pure quantum states, and this is a subject with which I had endless discussions also with Sydney, uh, if you assume black holes to form finite uh, quantum states, then you can actually count them. And you can count them in a very elementary way, by very basic arguments, to find that the, the total number of states is such as if uh, on every fundamental square on the black hole horizon, you have one bit of information. And so the black hole behaves a little bit like this thing where bits of information are switching on and off according to some law of physics. So my present assignment is, as I see it, to figure out what those laws of physics are. How do these bits and bytes of information, what kind of laws do they obey, how, sh how should I describe them, and how does that follow from the interactions that we know today, such as these, the standard model interactions and the gravitational interactions. So if you do that, the black hole seems like an ordinary particle. You can have particles coming in to make a black hole, and the black hole eventually will evaporate by emitting Hawking particles. And all this looks like a great big Feynman diagram. So black holes should be part of a unified theory of all interactions, and they, they should be part of, of, of the game of Feynman diagrams. And uh, only if you understand black holes completely, you might be able to understand how to do your grand unification and how to make a complete theory at the Planck scale. This has been a starting point which I'd like to, uh, to, to explore much deeper. Um, so the question, of course, is whether black holes, elementary particles, are ele all elementary particles black holes, does one continuously merge into the other at the Planck scale? This is the, I think, very important question that uh, one could ask here. Um, and uh, let me see, uh, I wanted to go to this picture. Um, so if you make such an assumption, you can actually do a lot, because actually we know a lot of the interactions of the in and outgoing particles. We know that they interact gravitationally. So suppose you include the gravitational interaction between particles going into the black hole and particles coming out of a black hole, and if you assume furthermore that um, that the black hole ought to obey a unitary scattering matrix. Then actually, you can find the properties of this matrix, and what I find is that the property can be expressed into a mathematical diagram or figure, which is this shape. Now, string theorists will say, ah, that's a closed string amplitude, and it's nearly right. It has all the characteristics of a closed string amplitude, where closed strings are coming in from below, and they, form, they, they cover the black hole horizon, and then they emerge at the other end. And so this looks like a string diagram. And it's nearly right, except that the string constant is imaginary in this calculation. Very odd, something I don't quite understand. I haven't seen other string theorists coming up with a string theory where the string constant is imaginary. But that comes out of this calculation. And it's not just a Wick rotation. It's not like that, because you really find that the resonances are on 
rigid trajectories which, which are rotated 90 degrees in the complex plane, as it has very deep resonances. So it's, it's a very strange situation. The uh, simulation I like to show is that these are closed strings coming into the horizon of the black hole, spreading over the horizon, leaving other open stri uh, closed strings uh, behind, and those closed strings then leave the black hole as Hawking radiation. This is the picture one gets out of um, these uh, uh, considerations of black holes. And, um, and the other observation one, one finds is the fundamental distinction between white holes and black holes. Now, Sydney was a uh, is, is a lover of science fiction, so he also likes the idea of things coming out of a black hole. So there always has been the notion of a white hole. A white hole being an object which is simply the time reverse of a black hole. If a black hole absorbs objects and emits Hawking radiation, well, the white hole absorbs Hawking radiation and emits objects. The question is, are these, thing, these things distinct objects? The answer is no. The relation between black holes and white holes is exactly as the relation between the particle in momentum space and particle in position space. If you have characterized the black hole as a state, it is the superposition of an infinite set of white holes and vice versa. So a particle with a definite momentum is a superposition of infinite number of particles with definite positions and vice versa. So the relation of black holes and white holes is just exactly that one. And uh, that scheme makes a lot of sense. Well, um, I would uh, like to, to say much more, but I think my time is over, and I'd like to, um, to end uh, my, my talk with, uh, again, uh, expressing my best wishes for Sydney, and uh, thank you, because we have learned, as all of us have said, we've learned a lot from Sydney. Thank you very much. Uh, that is what seems to come out. The string wraps exactly once around your eyes. And, uh, so uh, it's like the animation show, if I can go back to it. Um, it's, it's, what this oh, it's what this animation shows. Oh. Mm -hmm. it so uh, the closed strings come from all directions. They their, their string world sheet sits on the horizon exactly once and then uh, the, uh, the other open strings are left behind and they come out. And it is basically saying that the horizon, the black hole horizon, is the world sheet of a string, on a exactly one string. This is how my amplitude seems to behave with the distinction from ordinary string theory that it's, a, it's an imaginary string constant. And everything else then computable. And what's nice about this is that uh, I haven't put string theory in. This is just what comes out. In, or if you have different number of space dimensions, these would not be strings, but they would be brains. Because um, this is a string in a three for a 3 plus 1 dimensional black hole. It would have been particles in 2 plus 1 dimensions and so on. So, uh, uh, so in a sense, perhaps it's a dual of a string. If that helps. <laughs>